The one prominent feature of the Nirvana picture is naturally the central figure and his quiet passing away, surrounded by his disciples. Contrast this with the crucifixion of Christ, with blood oozing from the head and from his side. He is stretched upright against the cross with an expression of the utmost pain and suffering, whereas the Buddha looks as if contentedly asleep on the couch with no signs of distress. The vertical Christ represents an intense spirit of fight, but the horizontal Buddha is peaceful. When we look at the latter, everything that goes against the spirit of contentment is excluded from our consciousness. The Buddha lies contented, not only with himself but with all the world and with all its beings, animate and inanimate. Look at those animals, those gods, and those trees that are weeping over his parting. To my mind, this is a scene pregnant with meaning of the utmost significance. Is it not a strong demonstration of the fact that the Buddhists are not at war with nature, but that they and nature are one in living the life of the Dharma? This idea, and the real feeling of living one and the same life in the Dharma, makes the Buddhists feel at once at home with surrounding nature. When they listen to the crying of a mountain bird, they recognize the voice of their parents, when they see the lotus flowers in the pond, they discover in them the untold glory and magnificence of the Buddha realm. This is further the reason why they have the so-called soul-consoling rite performed for the morning glories, which are weeded out to give room to the better qualified kind, or for all kinds of poor animals who are killed for various reasons to help humanity, or for the painter's worn-out brushes, which serve them in so many useful ways to produce their masterpieces in varied styles. The love of nature of the Japanese is thus seen to be deeply colored with their religious insight and feeling. The Nirvana picture in this respect is illuminating as it sheds much light on the Japanese psychology. It was due, I am told, to the genius of the Sung Zen monk artists that the Buddha or Bodhisattvas came to be painted along with the animals and plants. Until then, the Buddha and Bodhisattvas were represented as beings transcending the reach of human feelings. They were supernatural beings, as it were. But when Zen came to control the religious consciousness of the Chinese and the Japanese people, it took away from Buddhist figures that aloof, unconcerned, rather unapproachable air which had hitherto characterized them. They came down from the transcendental pedestal to mingle with us common beings, and with common animals and plants, rocks and mountains. When they talked, stones nodded their heads, and plants pricked up their ears. That is the reason why the Buddha's nirvana is so intimately shared by all forms of being as we observe in the picture. The famous nirvana picture of the Tofukuji Zen Monastery at Kyoto was painted in the 15th century by one of its monks, Chodensu, one of the greatest painters of Japan. It is one of the largest hanging pictures of this class in Japan, measuring about 39 by 26 feet. It is said that, at the time of a civil war which devastated the greater part of Kyoto early in the 16th century, the army of the Hosokawa family utilized this Nirvana picture for screening their camp from the winds. There is a legend in connection with the production of this renowned picture which is characteristic of the Buddhist philosophy of life. When Chodensu was engaged in this grand work, a cat used to visit him and sit by him watching the progress of the picture. The artist, who wanted ultramarine in mineral form, playfully remarked, If you are good enough to bring me the stuff I want, I will have your picture in this nirvana. The cat had been generally missing, for some unknown reason, in nirvana pictures executed until then. Hence Chodensu's remark. And miraculously enough, the following day, the cat brought him the painting ingredient he wanted, and besides, led him to the place where it could be found in abundance. The artist's delight was beyond measure, and to keep his word he painted the cat in his nirvana picture, for which that cat has ever since had a nationwide reputation. Is it not a strange story? And it well illustrates the Buddhist attitude toward animals, which is also that of the Japanese people. In fact, Japanese literature abounds with stories of this kind. 
but instead of citing more stories, it will suit our purpose better to give just a few more references from the history of Japanese culture, wherein an intense appreciation of the objects of nature is expressed by our poets and artists. And the significant fact is that these objects are not necessarily confined to things commonly considered beautiful, or those suggestive of an order beyond this evanescent and ever-changing world. Changeability itself is frequently the object of admiration, for it means movement, progress, eternal youthfulness, and it is associated with the virtue of non-attachment, which is characteristically Buddhistic as well as an aspect of Japanese character. The morning glory is one of the most common flowering plants in Japan. It is quite an art in the cultivators to make the plant yield to their artistic treatment, and competitive exhibitions take place early in summer everywhere in Japan. There are so many changing conditions to be taken into consideration when one hopes for fine large flowers on the vine, but ordinarily it will bloom profusely throughout the summer, over the country fences, walls, hedges, and anywhere. The one peculiarity is that it blooms fresh every morning, and there are never any of yesterday's flowers. However splendid the flowers are this morning, they fade even before noon of the same day. This evanescent glory has appealed very much to the Japanese imagination. I do not know whether this momentaristic tendency in Japanese psychology is in their native blood or is due in some measure to the Buddhist Weltanschung, but the fact is, beauty is something momentary and ever fleeting, and if it is not appreciated while it is fully charged with life, it becomes a memory and its liveliness is entirely lost. This is exemplified in this poem about the morning glory. Each morn as the sun rises, the flowers are newly fashioned, glorious in their first awakening to life. Who says the creeper is short-lived? It keeps on blooming so long. Beauty is ever alive, because for it there is no past, no future, but the present. You hesitate, turn your head, and it is no more. The morning glory must be admired at its first awakening as the sun rises. So it is with the lotus. This is the way the Japanese people have learned from Zen teachings how to love nature, how to be in touch with the life running through all objects, including human beings. Another poem runs thus. The pine tree lives for a thousand years, the morning glory but for a single day, yet both have fulfilled their destiny. There is no fatalism in this. Each moment pulsates with life both in the pine tree and in the morning glory. The worth of this moment is not measured by the one thousand years of the one and the single day of the other, but by the moment itself, for this is absolute in each of them. Therefore, beauty is not to be spoiled by the thought of fatalism or evanescence. When Chiyo, the eighteenth-century haiku poetess, found the morning glory blooming around the well, her mind was so occupied with its beauty and with a feeling of holiness that she had no desire to disturb the flower for any practical purpose. The plant could easily and quietly have been removed from the rope or pole around which it probably was entwined, but the idea never occurred to her. The sense of beauty and holiness was something that should not be defiled by mundane hands. What may be called a divine inspiration flashes upon our consciousness at the sight of an object of nature one which is not necessarily beautiful, but may even be ugly, from the so-called common-sense point of view. When this takes place, we are so raised from our earthly occupations that merely giving vent to the experience may sound curiously factual and prosaic and even sacrilegious. It is only when we are elevated to the same height that we can grasp the full meaning of the utterance and see into the secrets that are concealed in the poet's feeling for nature. The frog does not ordinarily seem a beautiful creature, but when it is found perching on a lotus or basho leaf still fresh with the morning dew, it stirs the haiku poet's imagination. A solitary frog drenched in rain rides on a basho leaf unsteadily. A quiet summer scene is depicted by means of a green-backed amphibious animal. To some, 
an incident like this may seem too insignificant to call out any poetical comment, but to the Japanese, especially to the Buddhist Japanese, nothing that takes place in the world is insignificant. The frog is just as important as the eagle or the tiger. Every movement of it is directly connected with the primary source of life, and in it and through it one can read the gravest religious truth. Hence Basho's poem on a frog leaping into the ancient pond in his park. This leap is just as weighty a matter as the fall of Adam, for there is here, too, a truth revealing the secrets of creation. Consider this haiku poem. By a little kitten sniffed at, creeps the slug unconcerned. Here is also a bit of human playfulness and sweetness. References to such happenings in nature are constantly met with throughout Japanese literature, but especially in haiku poetry, which developed wonderfully during the Tokugawa period. The haiku is singularly concerned with little living things, such as flies of all kinds, lice, fleas, bugs, the singing insects, birds, frogs, cats, dogs, fishes, turtles, and so on. It is also deeply concerned with vegetables, plants, rocks, mountains, and rivers. And as we know, the haiku is one of the most popular methods used by the Japanese people to express their philosophical intuitions and poetic appreciation of nature. In the feeling compressed within the smallest number of syllables, we detect the soul of Japan transparently reflected, showing how poetically or intuitively sensitive it is toward nature and its objects, non-sentient as well as sentient. It goes without saying that the haiku embodies the spirit of Basho, its modern founder, and that the spirit of Basho is the spirit of Zen expressing itself in the 17 syllables. Probably the best way to illustrate the Japanese love of nature in relation to the spirit of Zen Buddhism is to analyze the various concepts that have entered into the construction of the tea room or tea house where the so-called art of tea is conducted in accordance with a set of rules. The rules have not by any means been arbitrarily compiled, but they have gradually and unconsciously grown out of the artistically trained minds of the tea masters. And in the composition of these minds we find the Japanese instinct for nature thoroughly disciplined in the philosophy of Zen, morally, aesthetically and intellectually. When we know all about the tea, its history, its practice, its conditions, its spiritual background, and also the moral atmosphere radiating from it, we can say that we also comprehend the secrets of Japanese psychology. Let me describe a tea room in one of the temples attached to Daitokuji, the Zen temple which is the headquarters of the tea. Where a series of flagstones irregularly arranged comes to a stop, there stands an insignificant-looking straw-thatched hut, low and unpretentious to the last degree. The entrance is not by a door, but by a sort of aperture. To enter through it, a visitor has to be shorn of all his encumbrances, that is to say, both his swords, long and short, which in the feudal days a samurai used to carry all the time. The inside is a small, semi-lighted room, about ten feet square. The ceiling is low and of uneven height and structure. The posts are not smoothly planed and finished. They are mostly of natural wood. After a little while, however, the room grows gradually lighter as our eyes begin to adjust to the new situation. We notice an ancient-looking kakemono in the alcove with some handwriting or a picture of Sumie. An incense burner emits a smoke of fragrance, which has the singular effect of soothing one's nerves. The flower vase does not contain more than a single flower stem, not at all gorgeous or ostentatious, but like a little white lily blooming under a rock surrounded by the somber pines, the humble flower in these surroundings is enhanced in beauty and attracts the attention of the small gathering. Now we listen to the sound of boiling water in the kettle, resting on a tripod over a fire in the square hole cut in the floor. The sound is not actually that of boiling water, but comes from the heavy iron kettle, and it is most appropriately likened by the connoisseur to a breeze that passes through the pine grove. It adds greatly to the serenity of the room, 
for a man here feels as if he was sitting alone in a mountain hut where a white cloud and the pine music are his only consoling companions. To take a cup of tea with friends in this environment, talking probably about the Sumier sketch in the alcove or some artistic topic suggested by the tea utensils in the room, lifts the mind above the perplexities of life. The warrior is saved from his daily occupation of fighting, the businessman from his ever-present idea of money-making. Is it not something, indeed, to find in this world of struggles and vanities a corner, however humble, where someone can rise above the limits of relativity and have even a glimpse of eternity? The following verses on the cherries are freely culled from Japanese poetry from the 9th to the 20th century in order to show how passionately the people of Japan are attached to flowers, in fact, to all objects of nature. This feeling is not necessarily connected with the teaching of Zen, but Zen helped a great deal to deepen the aesthetic sensibility of the Japanese mind and finally to root it in the religious intuitions that rise from a mystic understanding of nature. As before, the translations are almost literal, with just enough explanation to make the original sense intelligible in the English dress. Like poems in any language, those in Japanese cannot be rendered into a foreign language with all their subtle sentiments and literary artistries. Incidentally, let me remark that as with Sumie painting, the Japanese mind has managed to express its poetic feelings in the fewest possible number of words. The waka of 31 syllables has become the haiku of 17. Some think that the Japanese mind has not yet quite differentiated philosophy from life and ideas from immediate experiences. That is to say, it has not yet attained to the highest degree of intellectuality, and that for this reason it is still satisfied with the shortest poetic form, such as the waka or haiku, in which no marshalling of ideas, no intellectual unfolding of highly developed feelings is practicable. Others state that the Japanese vocabulary is poor and limited, and that with such a medium no great poetry is produced. These criticisms may be true as far as they go, but all generalizations are only expressive of partial truth. The reason for Japanese poetry still awaits adequate analysis in various terms, including the psychological, philosophical, and historical background in which it has thrived. One thing at least that I may remark about Japanese poetry is that being short, it omits making specific references to ideas, experiences, and surroundings leading up to its composition, and also to those derivable from it, these omissions are to be supplied by the reader, who therefore must be very well acquainted with the physical and psychological setting in which the poet lives. The genius consists in selecting a few significant reference points by which he is able to make the reader effectively conjure up all the poetic associations contained in his seventeen syllables. But we must remember that the secrets of the haiku are not necessarily in its mere suggestibility. To give a few examples, Ryota of the 18th century has a haiku expressing his feeling for the moon, which, after having been hidden from him night after night because of so many continuous spring rainfalls, appears softly and unexpectedly through the pine trees. This must have been a most delightful surprise to him. The rainy season in Japan is very gloomy and trying to those who love the spring moonlight in the evening, when its tender, mellow, relaxing shadow is cast all over the hazy, vaporous earth. In the June rains, one night, as if by stealth, the moon through the pines. The haiku, as it stands in Japanese, is no doubt unintelligible to most English readers, while its Chinese translation in four lines with five characters to each line gives a fuller idea. Tis midsummer, and my grass hut is dreary. Every evening I fall asleep to the sound of rain. Suddenly the full moon hangs in the sky, and the shadow of the pine tree on my garden. Tentoku's humanitarianism called out the following haiku, which has now become a proverb. First snow this, that also man's child. 
barrel picker. This is to all appearances nonsensical, but to the Japanese who know the first snow of the year, and also what a barrel picker in feudal days means, the present haiku is full of pathos. The day of the first snowfall is probably the first cold day of winter, but it is at the same time the day for the leisure class to have a friendly little sake party at a suburban restaurant with a fine garden. The poet was also in all likelihood on his way to such a party when he saw a poor boy picking up small sake casks thrown out in the streets. The boy was not warmly clad, in tatters probably, and barefooted. This called forth the poet's sympathy. The boy is also a man's child, and why should he have to suffer so when there are many others of the same age luxuriating in rich idleness? The sense of justice asserts itself. A waka, or yuta, has thirty-one syllables and can express somewhat more than a haiku, but words of comment are often found necessary to connect mere suggested thoughts. One of the reasons why waka did not expand into more syllables is that when the Japanese poet wanted to express himself more fully, he had recourse to what may be called a prose poem, of which we have various forms in Japanese literature. The following poems on the cherry are divided into four headings. The first is concerned chiefly with the wind and rain, which are always apt to scatter the flowers too soon. They are not lasting flowers in any way, only about a week in bloom. They all burst out suddenly early in April when the mountains and the riverbanks appear to be masses of flowers. This is especially noticeable, as most trees are still bare then. Where is the shelter of the flower-scattering wind? Can anyone tell me? For I want to see him at his home and lodge my complaint. I thought this was the frontier gate, when no winds were allowed to pass. But lo, the mountain path is strewn with the fallen petals of the cherries. What a pity, O oh, cherry blossoms, so hurriedly scattering away. Why not follow the spirit of spring, so peaceful, so relaxing, so eternally contented? Let us not blame the wind indiscriminately that scatters the flowers so ruthlessly. I think it is their own desire to pass away before their time has come. Nowhere is the spring now. I blame neither the wind nor the world, for even in the remotest parts of Yoshino the cherries are visible no more. The second group sings of the glorious sight when the cherry blooms are all out. It is really a magnificent view to see. For instance, the whole mountain of Yoshino covered with gorgeous flowers, mostly pink. Let a warm, relaxing sun shine on them through the hazy atmosphere, and the whole populace of Tokyo or Kyoto will altogether lose their heads. Advanced in age, I am old indeed, no gainsaying this, but as I look at these blossoming cherries, how cheered up I feel in spirit. There comes a wood-gatherer, walking down the meandering mountain path. Tell me, O oh my friend, those on the peak, are they cherry blossoms or clouds? The long-cherished desire of my heart, year after year, to see the Yoshino cherries in bloom, fulfilled today. How radiant, yet how peaceful and relaxing the spirit of spring is. Surely out of this spirit all these blossoming mountain cherries burst. Would that all people inhabiting this globe come to this land of ours, come to this mountain of Yoshino, and look at the cherries in full bloom. Choosing these long spring days as most opportune, the cherries have their blooming season. As I gaze at them, I think of the ancient days of the gods, days of contentment. Yoshino Yama, behind the mists, I know not how it is, but as far as my sight extends, there's nothing but a mass of blossoming cherries. Dressed in scarlet-colored armor and wearing an ancient sword, 
I would be a more appropriate site amidst these mountain cherries in full glory. The third group refers to the spirit of the flowers in whatever way it may be interpreted by the poets. To the mountain village this spring eve, I come and listen to the monastery bell, watching the cherries in bloom and petals softly falling. This ancient capital of Shiga is dilapidation itself now, except for the mountain cherries, blooming as gloriously as ever. The evening is come. I make a lodging under yonder cherry tree. The flower will then be my host tonight. Blooming and then scattering, and leaving all to rain and wind, the cherries are no more now, but their spirit forever remains unruffled. This last group of poems depicts the poet's anxious hopes that the cherries bloom. One thing at least which makes the Japanese think so much of them is that they are to us the symbol of the spring. When they are in bloom, the season reaches its height, days grow longer, and we are glad that winter is really behind. When the cherries begin to bloom, let me know at once. The mountain man has not forgotten my word. I hear him come. Saddle my horse, quick. When at Yoshino the cherries are about to bloom, my heart is anxiously drawn to the white clouds veiling the mountain tops these spring mornings. Saigyo, to whom I have already made frequent references, is an indelible name not only in the history of Japanese literature, but in that of Buddhist influence on Japanese culture. He belongs to the pre-Zen period, but his spirit, his understanding of nature, and his ardent aspiration to live with nature, to be always one with nature, connected him closely with Seshu, Rikyu, Basho, and many others. In fact, Basho groups himself with Saigyo as belonging to the same class. Saigyo's love for the cherries was such as to make him utter this. My prayer is to die underneath the blossoming cherry in that spring month of flowers when the moon is full. In Japan and China, the death of the Buddha is recorded as having taken place on the fifteenth day of the second moon of the lunar calendar. Hence Saigyo's wish to die about that time when the cherries are also likely to be blooming. The second moon generally corresponds to late March or early April of our calendar. Saigyo's prayer was fulfilled for he died on the sixteenth day of the second moon in the first year of Kenkyu, 1190. His attachment to the cherries went even beyond his grave for his request was, Make the offering to Buddha of cherry blossoms, if people of the future should think of me. Among other poems on the cherries, Saigyo has these, showing how passionately he was in love with them, as well as with other objects of nature. Unknown and unadmired, even I live on in this world. Why do these cherries then pass away, so heartlessly from the sight of the admiring crowds? At this late date, no flowers could forget the spring. They will soon be out, no doubt. Leisurely awaiting them, I would pass this day under these trees. I feel deeply concerned to find on which mountaintops the cherries begin to flower first. How I long to see them. Saigyo was also, as most Japanese are, a great lover of the moon. The moonlight singularly attracts the Japanese imagination, and any Japanese who ever aspired to compose a waka or a haiku would hardly dare to leave the moon out. The meteorological conditions of the country have much to do with this. The Japanese are lovers of softness, gentleness, semi-darkness, subtle suggestiveness, and everything in this category. They are not fiercely emotional. While they are occasionally surprised by earthquakes, they like to sit quietly in the moonlight, enveloped in its pale, bluish, soul-consoling rays. The moonlight is illuminating enough, but owing to the atmospheric conditions, all objects under it appear not too strongly individualized. A certain mystic obscurantism pervades, and this seems to appeal to the Japanese generally. Saigyo, all alone in his mountain retreat, 
communes with this spirit of the moon, of whom he cannot help thinking even after his death, or because of whom he is loath to pass away from this life, although he may have no other attachments here. In fact, a land of purity is no other than the supermundane projection of such aesthetic spiritual appreciations. Not a soul ever visits my hut except the friendly light of the moon peeping through the woods. And finally, some day I may have to pass away from this world, alas, forever with a longing heart for the moon, for the moon.